All right, comedian T.J. Miller is going to be coming into the studio in just a moment. That, that's if Jeffrey will stop talking to him. Oh, really is Jeffrey weird. out there talking his ear off? Maybe the most bizarre thing he's done yet. Why? What's it, what did he do? T.J. Miller sits down and he goes, Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Do you like the movie Soul Plane? <laughs> and he goes, I guess. He says, here, let me show you a clip. And then he pulls up a clip of Soul oh, Plane. No. And then makes T.J. Miller look at it and actually hands his laptop laptop off to T.J. Miller. And he has to sit there and pretend to be interested in a three-minute clip well, about Soul Plane as he describes what's going on in the clip because apparently the volume doesn't work. Did he think T.J. was in that movie? Let's bring in T.J. Miller. Uh, he's guy. in the movie Cloverfield. I, I hear he's going to be in this Transformers movie, too, with Mark Wahlberg, oh, I think, big as time. well. Uh, yeah, and, uh, but I, none of that comes close to the idea that you just put in my mind of being in Soul Plane. <laughs> How come that is, wasn't a part of my life? And I got to say... I've seen Soul Plane in a lot of different mediums, a lot of different ways. I saw it in 3D when it first came out. I've seen it with the director's commentary, and none of it has come close <laughs> to Jeffrey describing it as your radio show plays loudly over the very low volume of his laptop. And he explains to me exactly what's going on. He's the strangest guy you'll ever meet. I, I mean, he's I kind it's of very loved bizarre. It. It's so rare that somebody's so friendly that, you know, Within seconds of meeting them, they're like, do you want to see a scene from my favorite movie? <laughs> this is my favorite scene, I think. Uh, well, Usually it takes like an hour or two to get to that point. And he was like, let's get into it. I like Soul Plane. Well, good morning, by the way. To you. Yes, morning. Jeffrey, what no, is it? No, I just it? wanted to say, I was just trying to lighten the mood a little bit. Oh, okay. Why lighten, lighten the mood. Lighten, lighten the mood. Yeah, why? Did he come in grave. depressed or no, something? No, he didn't come in, but uh, he's a comedian. I figured just give him something to laugh about. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> That's exactly right. He picked... And when he saw me, I mean, you look at me, you see me, you see Soul Plane, you know? <laughs> you look at me, you say, yeah, I know what'll lighten this guy's mood. I hate to say it, though. I hate to say it, but when I first saw him, when he comes in, I thought he was the second coming of uh, wrestler Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, because he looks just like okay, him. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I think I look more like Jesus got in a really bad breakup like <laughs> seven months ago, and he's just now getting around back on the horse, you know? Well, you have a beard, and your hair is long, and uh, I hear you're from Denver. You almost mm. appear just as... I lived in Denver for a while. This you, is, you look like a Denver guy. A lot of guys in Denver, they're all sort of uh, hippie slash snow, snowboard tree hugging guys. Out there, basically. Yeah. Right, so, it, I mean, Boulder yeah. is a lot more of that, but yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I would fit in Denver right now. I also look like a guy who would be like, Do you want to smoke weed? And if you're like, <laughs> Yeah, he's like, Cool, you got any? Like, that's kind of the vibe that I have. I what think. do you think about what's going on in Denver now? Because you're I think from it's there. Great, yeah. yeah, with all this weed that they've legalized. I think it's, you know, I think it's pretty progressive. California has medical marijuana legalized, but they're still having a lot of trouble. And I think it's pretty great that Colorado just said, let's just legalize it and see what happens. Well, the thing in California, it's a joke, this medical marijuana. Everyone has a medical marijuana yeah, I card. Have, I have a card. For, it's uh, for anxiety. Primarily anxiety about getting arrested for marijuana. <laughs> and it's cleared that right up. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, yeah, oh, you, it's really easy to get a card. Um, but, you know, marijuana, I mean, I, I travel with this guy, Nick Vatterot, who's a great comedian. He's got a great podcast, really funny guy. And he and I talk often about how if you reversed, if alcohol was illegal and marijuana was legal, yeah. what would society be like? Yeah. So we just think about that sometimes because there's not a lot of bar fights with stoners, you know? There's not a lot of people. Usually they just kind of argue about whether or not a gazelle is faster than a <laughs> cheetah for like an hour and a half. And then they you and, know, I, and they might fight over where to eat, but eventually they both agree I, on Taco uh, Bell. I never... I don't smoke weed, and and I mean I have, but the only time that I ever smoke weed is if I'm already drunk, and that just it 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 makes me comatose. It just puts me way over the edge. I've never sat down and just smoked weed without drinking first. I don't know why. It just it just doesn't appeal to me. I, I enjoy the drinking, I guess, but maybe I should try smoking. Some I mean, weed. well, the interesting thing is what's going to happen in Denver with the recreational use, the tourism. It's like if you go to Denver. You, you can legally smoke marijuana, and I think you just can't take it out of the state, and so they have to figure out how to regulate that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I never smoked marijuana until I got to California. I just didn't smoke it in college, and didn't in Colorado. It just wasn't appealing. Same yeah. thing. And then in California, you sort of, the culture is kind of reversed. People will drink a little bit, but in Denver, 
If you drink like six or seven beers, that's just probably the first bar that you're going to be at. <laughs> Whereas in Los Angeles, if you drink six or seven beers in one sitting, yeah, depending on the company, the people will be like, listen, we need to talk to you. I think it's time you go to Miracles down in Malibu. <laughs> and uh, But everybody smokes weed. Everybody yeah. smokes marijuana. And so I just sort of said, well, I should at least give this a try. And it was the same thing. I like smoked it a little bit without drinking and it was okay and then i smoked a little more and then i kind of got a tolerance to it yeah and uh it's you know it's very it's great it's now relaxing. do you smoke now do you smoke it all the time then no how no, often to go in and out you know I'd, I'd say only four or five times a day so not all the time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's lots of points throughout the day in which i'm not smoking marijuana <laughs> right now it's one of them um no i mean you know you'll smoke let's see how you smoke it um I smoke it recreationally, like in Colorado, but uh, in in California, I do all smoke it for if I get very anxious or if I'm having trouble sleeping. Yeah. Or sometimes it helps me concentrate because I was very ADHD growing up, and there's a sativa strain that can make can sort of help focus you and it gives you energy. It's fascinating. I'd like to try that. Um, you. You are you were in the Cloverfield movie. Uh, you, I was you, in the Cloverfield. I, you've seen that yes. movie, right? Yeah. His voice is the guy. Who, I haven't seen the movie, but but it's it's uh, behind the camera. Behind the camera, right? Do you He's get easily motion yeah. sick. Yeah. Uh, no, not particularly. Why? That that will do that because it's like the handheld camera yeah, thing will throw you off, of puke right there in the theater or whatever. Some, a couple of people did puke yeah. when they went and saw the movie when it first came out, and I've had a couple of experiences where I go, yeah, I was uh, I was in the movie Cloverfield. They go, oh, really? What part? And I was like, the cameraman. And they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. well, I got so sick during that film. And I'm like, sorry. How did you end up, because you were just doing stand-up comedy primarily. I'm assuming you don't have an acting background, or maybe you do. I don't know. I mean, a little bit. I went to the British American Dramatic Academy. and I Well, have that a sounds minor. very official. I know. Uh, but I have a minor. I know. It sounds way more official than it was. <laughs> It was just a workshop in Akron, you know what I mean? <laughs> they call it the British American Dramatic Academy. But um, no, I so I, and I, I had a minor in theater, but it was from the George Washington University, so that's not particularly uh, impressive. I So I just, I had studied acting, but more as a medium of comedy. So I actually started as an improviser. I was an improviser in college, and then when I went to Chicago, and I was doing stand-up in tandem with the improvisation, and then was taking acting classes and doing some acting. And then, uh, yeah, I started doing Second City, which is an improvisational and sketch. Famous, Chicago, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then kind of got an agent and found my way to auditioning for a show in Chicago that was, that was on ABC in Los Angeles. And I got the part, when did the pilot, it got picked up, and that was the show Carpoolers. That's Jerry amazing. Jerry O'Connell. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And then when I went out there... As I was filming the pilot, they had me audition for these two movies, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, the Judd Apatow film, sure. and then this other film by a guy that I hadn't heard of. And so I went out there and I auditioned for the two, and I thought the Forgetting Sarah Marshall went, went pretty well. And then after we were done filming the pilot, my agent in Chicago calls me and goes, so I guess they want you for this movie? And I was like, no way. Forgetting Sarah Marshall, the Judd Apatow film? They want me to do it? And he's like, no, the other one. And I was like, okay, what's that one? He said, it's this guy, J.J. Abraham or something like that. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, so they want you for it, and so we'll see what happens. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So it's like a little indie film. He was like, yeah, I think so. And no, it was Cloverfield. Wow. It, that was the full deal. And I didn't know who J.J. Abrams was because I hadn't watched Lost at that point. When, so now I didn't when, even get it. When J.J. Abrams makes all these movies, like the Star Trek movie and yeah. all, all the stuff that the, the guy has done, He's now doing, what is he doing now? Is he, uh, what is he doing now? Is he taking over the Star Wars movie? Or what's he doing? Yeah, he did. He's taking over Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, he's, so w you worked with the guy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, how, you know, how much or how uh, much interaction you had with the guy, but are you tempted to just like try and reach out to him and go, hey, put me in this movie too? Or Yeah, except for the movies that he does, I... I didn't really understand. I still don't understand why Hollywood gives me any acting roles at all. Because I'm not a very good actor. I mean, I was in a film, Yogi Bear 3D, and that was an incredible performance and an incredible film. 
I've, 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 I've never, I never actually have even heard of Yogi Bear 3D. I, I brought a couple copies, so I'll give those to you outside. I'm selling them out of my trunk in the parking lot throughout. I, I have an audition tape that they, uh, that that is yes. you auditioning for Yogi Bear the movie. Well, and so, yeah, this is him. This is T.J. Miller. I guess he's with a bear or an something. Actual bear. And and uh, here I it is. I sent this to Warner Brothers to mess with them. So. Here is so it's a 600 pound uh, grizzly bear. And you go to a zoo or something or someplace and get them to do this? A Hollywood, so yeah, it's, it's this training camp. You've seen kinda, what I can do in the room. And there you are standing there. I give you more of an idea of what I'm like interacting <laughs> with a real bear uh, for this audition for Yogi the Bear. I love you just standing there like, don't bite me. It's yeah. Okay. How scared were you? It wasn't that scary. Everybody's like, was it the scariest thing that's ever happened? No, and you'll see later. I mean, we get close enough to kiss. I, I mean, that thing. But see, people they do this kind of stuff, and these are still wild animals. Sure, this is a bear that's been trained to be in movies well, and that kind of stuff. This thing, if it if it just decides. It will swipe you with those huge claws. It's, I mean, it's so funny that you say that, especially with the claws, because that the animal trainer did say, he goes at one point. Well, he's telling you, he goes, all right, so don't, uh, don't put your hands near the bear's face. Don't put your arm around the bear at all. And I said, okay, uh, can I sit down? Near the, and he's like, no, you don't <laughs> sit near the bear. The bear will attack and, and thrash at your face with his claws. Don't sit down or lay down around the bear. I was like, okay. And he's like, don't make direct eye contact with the bear. If the bear get, stands up, don't look at the bear in the eyes or he will, he will uh, attack you with his claws. He will rip and tear at your face. <laughs> And it seemed like the whole point of the animal trainer wasn't to like help you feel comfortable, but just make you feel like an idiot for each question you ask. Like I said, if I hand him papers, can he hold the paper? No, he just can't hold papers. Don't hand him anything. Don't get well, your hands near him. Look, he'll I'm rip and tear at your face with his claws. Uh, and then later he goes. Uh, first of all, I give I give the bear these papers, and the bear is able to hold them. <laughs> which afterwards, I was kind of like, you see how the bear held the paper for me, <laughs> and uh, and then also. Uh, and towards the end of the video, if you watch it, he sort of leans into me as I guess he, he was having a good time and thought it was funny. He goes, Hey, you want to, uh, you want the bear to eat a marshmallow out of your mouth? And I was like, what, who are you just minutes ago? Don't, like, don't, don't even look, look at, the, at bear. the bear, right? Don't be near the bear. Don't touch the bear. And now you're saying you can, he'll eat a marshmallow out of your mouth. I think that might be what that. this part is right here. Maybe oh, where yeah, he puts a marshmallow in yeah, his mouth. There it is. Oh my God. And the bear, wow. The bear took it right out. Is this what got you the part in Yogi Bear 3D? Oh, man, I wish I could say that it was. Wouldn't that be the better story? <laughs> but it was, I, they had sort of been offered the role, and they were still finalizing some, some stuff. And I, uh, I sent this to try and clinch it, as it were, but uh -huh. as a joke, like my agents really said, he has some supplemental materials that he wants to share with you guys. He really thinks it's important for showing you what he would do with the part. Again, a very funny thing, just for an actor to be that serious about a part in Yogi Bear 3D. Yeah. Like, I like the idea that Warner Brothers is like, okay, we'll look at his supplemental materials, <laughs> and then it's me with a real bear acting like a real ding-dong. <laughs> uh, and then uh, T.J. Miller is here with us. He's going to be at the Funny Stop Comedy Club tonight at 8 uh, at and eight o'clock. And they know the 8 o'clock show is sold out, so now it's a ten, we added a 10 o'clock. All right, 10 o'clock. So, so please come and see the 10 o'clock show. 10 o'clock uh, tonight. Cuyahoga Falls, it's on State Road. Um, you're in this movie, and you say that your behavior changed while you were filming this movie. You started acting bizarrely. Yeah, I mean, boy, you guys did your research. The uh, Towards the end of the um, filming, I started to, like, narrate my own behavior. I was watching Soul Plane over and over and over <laughs> again. I was sort of, um, I was just kind of acting a little more bizarre. I was doing these tanglement puzzles, which are like, you know, the two horseshoes with the chain and the ring in the middle? Yeah. You got to try and get it out. Yeah. Things like that, but more complicated ones. Just weird stuff. And uh, I had thought, I was going insane. You, when you go insane, you don't think that you're going insane. You right. just think that you're starting to think at a higher plane than other people. or what? You just convince yourself that you're somehow thinking better than other people or something. Right. And so I started to do that. 
And then when I came back, finally, it took forever to finish the movie. It like got extended for, um, I think, over a month. So I was in New Zealand, you know, and I would later find out that my brain was bleeding just a little bit. And I had a hemorrhage in my frontal lobe from an AVM, an arterial venous malformation, which is a congenital disorder that uh, people are born with. You're born with that, yeah. You're usually, it's usually found in autopsy, as most people die from it. And uh, luckily, I had two seizures in a row um, a couple days after I got back and went to the hospital, and they found out, and so they removed a golf ball-sized piece of my brain. Wow. It was unstable and was bleeding and was causing me to sort of have overactivity in my right frontal lobe, which was making me act insane. So did they have to cut your skull open then to yeah. to do that? And, and, and I, mean, you, you, is your head, I mean, you really can't tell. You wouldn't know that you had your skull cut open. I don't think so. It might be why I have so much hair. But yeah, there's it's like from here down to my ear. They wow. cut open and before you I went in the surgery, they said, Well listen, you know, this has a ten percent fatality rate. So about one out of every ten people that do it <sighs> die. And I said, What happens if I don't get the surgery? And they're like, You'll probably die in your mid thirties and I was like, Let's roll the dice, buddy. Right. Let's do the surgery. You have to. You of course you have to. But how nervous were you? going into this because a lot of times like if, you, if you're in an accident or whatever that just happens you, there's no thinking about it in advance you you know you're going in for surgery yeah, they're I don't know. operating on your I wasn't brain very um i wasn't very scared i don't know i don't have a lot of death anxiety i'm not really afraid really of dying. yeah wow i would have I'm been in crapping the camp my of pants like, no i'm in the camp of like when you are Death is not, and when death is, you're not. So you guys never like, neither, you never really come across it. It's, you know what I mean? It's sort of, yeah. It's, and it happens in an instant, no matter what. But I, I remember on the way in kind of thinking, yeah, first of all, I was like, tell, I had to take care of the other people in the hospital room because they were all freaking out. And I was like, it's fine. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And then on the way in, I remember thinking, you know, I've had an excellent life. I really appreciate it. The time that I've had here, I kind of was like, if I die, that's okay. Really? Yeah. What's the big deal? Yeah, but you There's know a what? A lot of people that have, you know, 10, 10 or 15 years really from now, time. 20 years from now, you'll look back at that same thought that you had and you'll go, wow, that was a dumb thought because look at everything I've done in the past 10 or 20 years and I would have missed out on all of that. Yeah, but what am I missing out on, really? I've, I'm in Transformers 4. You could be in Yogi Bear right, right. 3D Part 2 for all you Yogi know. Yogi Bear 3D 2, <laughs> D 3. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. I could be in Yogi Bear 3D 2. Which I think would effectively kill me. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I mean, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of great things. Yeah, I'm working on this Mike Judge show on HBO. It's coming out April 6th. I'm doing this tour where I'm in like Columbus, Ohio at Woodlands Tavern tomorrow. And just yesterday was in like Arlington, Virginia. It's a pretty great experience. It's been great to still be alive, but... I don't. I wouldn't have known what I had missed out on if I had died. The, so the seizure. Matter. The seizure that you had. You were actually in your. I think what agent's office or manager's yeah, office. Yeah, I was or having like lunch with with this guy Nick Vatterot, who to, is touring with me right now, and our two managers and in so Beverly Hills. Did they think that when you started having this seizure, did they think that this was some sort of performance? It's bit the craziest that you were doing? story. Yeah, I mean, it's. I was in the middle of pitching. An idea for you remember Chat Roulette when that was like yeah a that thing website for a yeah. Yeah. yeah and so I was, I was pitching a movie about Chat Roulette where you randomly come across the video stream of this this guy comes across this girl and then he sees somebody in the background who has got a knife and is gonna and then you know he disconnects from her on accident uh -huh. but tries to figure out you know where to find her and as I'm in the middle of this pitch I'm like you know it's like a really scary guy that's behind her and then I had the seizure. <laughs> So it looked like I was sort of <laughs> acting out, I, you know, it looked, I was like, you know, this really scary guy's behind her, like, ah, 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 ah. I fell, <laughs> I literally fell out of my chair, and then, uh, and, and, and they're probably laughing, like, like, oh, that's oh, good, they, wow, they, they, said, they said that they were like, and Nick even said, he goes, they kind of were like, wow, he's, Really like dedicated to this pitch, to this pitch. This is great. Method actor here. Yeah, yeah. And then they looked at me and they're like, "Oh no, he's not breathing. He's a, he's an actor on meth, maybe, but that could be the only thing." Wow. So you, you but they they got you to a hospital or whatever. Yeah, was. they called an ambulance and luckily we got to a hospital. It would have been good. Uh, uh, wow. It would have been. Or is that? It would. 
Would have been bad. Would've been good. It would have been bad if I had not been able to go to hospital because it would have led to then a stroke and an aneurysm probably pretty quickly afterwards. So you're touring, you're doing comedy stuff now. Yeah, doing live stand-up all across the country. Why do that if you're going to be in this Transformers movie with Mark Wahlberg? Why? I would just say, hey, I've got a full plate. Uh, let me focus on that. Uh, why in the middle of this before you, I guess it's before you start shooting this Transformers movie, right? No, Transformers is done. Oh, you've already, you've already filmed this. Yeah, I oh, was already right. sort of in that psychological terrorist tornado that was kind of living inside of that world. When did you film it? Last year? Or? No, it was like, um, I guess it was during the summer. I guess I couldn't have said the word guess in a higher pitch voice. <laughs> guess not. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was it was in the summer because it's so hot, and I shot that in tandem with another movie that I'm starring in, which is an R-rated film from Universal called Search Party, and so um, I went back and forth between those two movies. But yeah, even when I was doing that, I would still do stand up. Mm -hmm. You know, if I could do stand up, if we f finished filming in time, I would go at night to a, you know a, an open mic in Austin, Texas, where we we're filming, or Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We were filming the other one, and I would still do stand-up. The reason I'm doing Nick's Funny Stop is because while I was filming this movie Unstoppable um, uh, with Denzel Washington, which is about a train that's unstoppable. Sure, yeah. I, I spoiler saw it, yeah. alert, it's, it is stoppable. <laughs> and I, I'm still upset that they called it, yeah. it that. I'm still upset. But I would so like, I'd shoot that. Hard to Stop would have been a better yeah, that, title. Yeah. <laughs> Difficult to stop the Denzel Washington. Um, so... I, I was sort of, I, I was here shooting that. It was with Tony Scott, and we would work all day, but you usually kept it to 12 hour days and we start early. And I would finish filming a 12 to 14 hour day, and I would drive from where we were shooting, which was near here, but it's it's not, I mean, not, not near here. It was like in between Akron and the Cuyahoga Falls, where the funny stuff is, was mm -hmm. about 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would get in my car after I finished filming. And the other people on set were all equally as sort of stupefied as to why I would do this. I'd drive 45 minutes to get to Cuyahoga Falls and do a five-minute guest set on the show mm. and then drive 45 minutes back, go to sleep, wake up, and do uh, and shoot more. Why do that? Is this just to keep yourself sharp or what? It does. It, it, helps, it helps to perform at night. I mean, it, it was really helpful in Transformers because... I would go on set, and Michael Bay, if he's unhappy, he'll tell you directly, you're not a funny person, nothing that you're saying is funny, I'm disappointed in you, I can cut you out of the movie, you should know that, all these things. Yeah. And although a very charming and sweet guy, um, you know, that can be, it can wreck your confidence in your comedy a little bit. Right. And so then if you go out at night and you perform, you know, stand-up for people that are laughing and having a great time, it renews your confidence, because like, oh, it doesn't matter what Hollywood thinks about me. These people in Ohio think that I'm they they're enjoying the comedy and I'm making them laugh. So that's the point of the whole thing. It's also kind of a reminder, and I'm just pretty I'm pretty devoted to the idea that it's important to do comedy and that people sort of tragedy permeates our everyday lives and people need a distraction and escapism from it. And so uh, you know the discipline that I bring to it is. Uh, reflective of how important I think it is just because, and it's for me, it's like, I don't want to do like movies and become a famous actor. And that's kind of not the idea behind that. It's that film and film and television have the greatest reach. So I can make the most people laugh all at once in the easiest sort of swift motion. And, um, so that's why I like transformers. It's like, that's not really a movie that I would do, but when, they talked about me auditioning for it, and I sort of discussed the role. It's like I kind of said, like, well, you know, I improvise, and this is the comedy I do, and this is what I would do in the film. If you'd like me on it, great, because I'd love to do comedy in your movie, because it's going to reach millions, hundreds of millions of people. Sure. But if, you know, if not, I don't want to be running around 
trying to run away from robots and talking. To, <laughs> I've already worked with two imaginary bears. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I've been around the block. <laughs> you know, I've fought a giant monster using just a you, video camera. You play Mark Wal. Now Mark Wahlberg is now going to be in these Transformer yeah, movies. Yeah, he's from signed here on, on for the next three. Uh, and so you Let's play do his T six. You play his best friend in this in mm-hmm. this movie that will be coming yeah. out. I play sort of his like. Yeah, his best friend. It's like when he was a senior in college, I was a freshman, mm-hmm. or I mean in high school, and that's sort of what it. The, it's the relationship is kind of like a little brother, older brother thing. But yeah, we're sort of best friends. Is this a reboot of the Transformers movie? Heck yeah! Uh, this is this let's, is. let's do it, man. We were just what, are we talking make about this. New movies. Well, we <laughs> yeah. were just talking about this the other day. I go, I can't what? understand why these movies like these spider-man movies these batman movies they do three movies and then they start over from the beginning and right. they make the same three movies again it's the same origin story it's the same crap. it's crazy it would be like wanting to have the same kind of hamburger joint in, this, <laughs> in every city all over the country is it, it, it i just i don't get this i i, I don't know it's, i must be must be exactly what americans want just like McDonald's. I guess so. We are, but uh, we are dumb for going and seeing we, it over and over and over and over. Familiarity again. is very safe for all of us, and you know what you're going to get, and you know what you're paying for. In an economy that's struggling, people don't want to like spend thirty bucks to go to the movies and have it be terrible. Yeah. Um. So I think that's why people do it, but it's got to stop at some point. I mean, now we're just making. Either reboots. It's like now it's RoboCop, Transformers. Right. It's just all movies we've all seen already. Right. What? Well, how's Michael Bay to work with? You, you, you mentioned him a little while it's, ago. It's uh, you know, it's like looking into the mind of madness, and then having it tell you like, move out of my way. I'm trying to get this shot. You what know? did you think of him at that consumer electronics show when I think it was Samsung or well, Toshiba or the someone? The weirdest thing, I think it was Samsung, but the weirdest thing is that working with him when he's on set, he's very specific. So he's he is, he's very stern, he's yelling a lot, he's telling people to move out of the way. He gives it to you very directly and without any sugar coating. There might even be some sour, you know, or some saltiness to it. And then as soon as you stop working, he's like the nicest guy. He would be like, like I, I my ex girlfriend now at the time I was just fighting with her, mm-hmm. and he she left town, and he he was like, so what are you doing tonight? It's your birthday. Are you taking your girl out? And I'm like, she laughed. We got a fight, and he's like, are you serious? All right, I'll take you out tonight. Let's go have dinner and drinks, and we'll take you out, me and my buddy. And he's just the nicest guy, you know, and um. Here he is. Uh, here's Michael Bay at Sam's at the Samsung CES. They, I love this. They bring him out because they're unveiling great. this new television set. And so they go, well, Michael Bay makes these movies. Let's have him just come out and say how great his movies will look on our television. But the guy, he chokes in a way that is epic. <laughs> I've, I've never seen anyone choke like Ladies this. Ladies and gentlemen, director and producer Michael Bay. So he walks out on the stage, hundreds, thousands of people maybe here at the uh, audience. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Michael. Joe. How is everyone today? Uh, my job as a director is I get to dream for a living. <laughs> Michael, you know, you're known for such unbelievable action. Well, what inspires you? How, what, how do you come up with these unbelievable ideas? Um, I create visual worlds that are so beyond every, everyone's normal life experiences. And Hollywood is a place that creates uh, a viewer escape. And um, what I try to do is, I, as a director, I try to. Uh, the type is all off. Sorry, but I'll just wing this. Tell us what you think. Yeah, we'll just we'll, we'll wing it right now. Um, I take I try to take people on an emotional ride, and. Um, The curve? How does it? Uh, how do you think it's going to impact uh, how viewers experience your movies? Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> then he just walks okay. right off the stage. And Ladies and this- gentlemen, let's thank Michael Bay for joining us. <laughs> People are just confused, and that guy just like, okay, let's uh, turn it. Yeah. Well, you know, he is. He is strange. It's strange. He's kind of shy around women, mm-hmm. and um, I don't think he loves public speaking. What I was going to say is that somehow after filming this thing, 
I mean, I went up to him at the end of the, the filming and I said to him, buddy, I, I want to tell you, because he shows a sizzle reel every week of what you've been shooting and it blows your mind. It's like, no matter how hard it is to shoot this thing, when, once you see it, you're like, oh, this is worth it. It's incredible. I've never seen it. So they sort this. of take a little bit and they just- They put the, it together, the, yeah. They put the effects in there yeah, quickly you so you can kind of see what it's going to look and like. It's, and it's, it's pretty mind blowing. I went up to him and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, it's- you really are one of the best at what you do. You're the best at what you do, but you're one of the best directors that's ever lived. It's incredible the way your stuff looks and how impacting it is. He's like, oh, really? You saw you liked it? And I said, yeah. I said, it it's almost makes working with you worth it. <laughs> <laughs> almost. <laughs> and he was like, ah, yeah, I am bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. <laughs> but you did like it. Did you see the shot where the, all the explosions <laughs> happen? And the, so he just, he goes right on past it. And uh, it's too surprising to me because I didn't I didn't think that he necessarily liked working with me or I, th I thought he might think I was difficult because they sort of if he would yell at me I'd yell right back at him and you know we went toe to toe a couple of times just in regular collaborative arguments you know but um, he doesn't care whether people like him really he I just wants the does. work to, to be the way yeah. that he envisions it and he's gotten to a point where he sort of accepts that some people hate him and some people like him but that's what the deal is. And since then, we've sort of become friends. He'll, like, invite me to parties and stuff, oh, yeah. and I've gotten to know him a little bit. And when this happened, I realized, I mean, I, th I think he was just so nervous, and the type was off, and he, he probably didn't want to necessarily be there in the first place. He's doing it more for the movie mm -hmm. to sort of raise awareness about Transformers uh, 4. So I saw that, and it was it's funny, but it's like, it is such a bummer. It's so weird because you, I don't know. Well, especially you, for a guy like you or a guy like me, you go, okay, you, you know, the, the the teleprompter is off. You make a joke about it, and you talk. move on, and you right, wing right, it. Right, you know, right. yeah, you go, hey, that's the, you know what? Mo Transformers 4 is going to look phenomenal on the curved screen or whatever. Right, and, exactly. And, <laughs> he and just he, jokes. I mean, it's not, it's not in his wheelhouse, you know? He's used to it, only yelling or talking to a group of people that work for him. Yeah. <laughs> so here he is with like a hundred people recording him, and I think I think it's funny. I, the, the only thing that made me laugh is he's like, "All right, let's just wing it. Let's wing it." And he kind of takes a second, and then he's like, "You know what? You're right. We're just gonna wing this." Like he's just telling himself over and over, and then he does not wing it. Like he just he flings himself. Maybe off he will have a little more respect for you actors from this point forward. I doubt it. <laughs> I think he'll have less respect for cell phone teleprompter. Uh, How does he does he treat? Mark Wahlberg differently because Mark Wahlberg's uh, yeah. a big star. Yeah. Does he yeah. treat him w w way differently I, than I would everyone think else? So. Yeah, Wahlberg. He would never yell at Wahlberg. They're, they, you know, they they are making the movie together. They're both producing it together, so it's just a different relationship they have. But it's very strange. They kind of get along really well and see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. But Wahlberg's kind of equally insane, also. I mean, there's a very there has to be a certain kind of madness to work at these levels, being this famous, having this much money in the mix, even if it's just like a level of confidence that has to be manufactured uh, in a way that most people can't even handle. That's kind of what these two guys are like. And so they, you know, but yeah, no, he would never yell at Wahlberg. It, was, it, was, it wasn't fair, though. He would sometimes yell at me because, you know, it's an action movie. So... We're running away from the robots, and Wahlberg, you know, is, I just don't think it's fair. It's like me huffing and puffing behind, <laughs> and he's like, TJ, come on, let's go, and I'm like, look, I, I was hired to be funny and have a toddler body <laughs> and kind of say things and look stupid while I did it. Why are you yelling at me? It's not fair. Like, Mark Wahlberg was in Lone Survivor, you know? He was in Shooter. I was recently at a Hardee's. It's just not, it's just not fair, you know? So there would be that, but Mar Wahlberg would sometimes turn to me and go, he'd go, he'd go, boy, I bet you didn't think you signed up for this, huh? And I was like, nope. And he said, uh, you know, if you'd known this is what it was, would you, uh, you probably wouldn't have uh, agreed to do the movie. And I was like, nope, you know? So he would sort of tease me about like, you know, you think it's easy to be an action star. Well, this is what it's really like. And I would sort of be like, I don't think it's easy to be an action star. Yeah. But it's interesting because with him, I couldn't really play the card. I mean, I would say, like, I'm a comedian. You're an action hero. Like, never the twain shall meet. But it's tough because he was in Ted. 
Right. So he was in the other huge talking bear comedy. <laughs> in, literally in the history of film. Those well, you the two paved, most you paved the way for it, Ted, I think, with That's your right. talking bear. That's what bear. I kept telling yes. him over and over yeah. again. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah, you kind of, like Wahlberg does really, he was really funny in The Other Guys. He does comedy as well as he does. He's a pretty fascinating guy. I mean, he's, they'll, they'll you'll cut, and in between takes, he would go over and get on his phone, and he'd be talking about... Which director are we going to get for Boardwalk Empire for this next for thing? Business and deals. And where, stuff. Yeah, how far yeah. are we along with the Entourage movie? What's going with this? I, I just often read this script. I like this. I, I often wonder how people in positions uh, like him. And by the way, T.J. Miller is here with us. He's going to be at the Funny Stop uh, tonight. Cuyahoga Falls, ten o'clock. Uh, Eight o'clock show is already sold out. I just wonder how people like that. Uh, or a guy like Ryan Seacrest, totally different. But but Ryan Seacrest has like a million projects. Yeah. I go, how do these guys have? Not only the time to do this, but the energy to do this. I do a stupid four and a half hour radio show, and I don't want to do anything else the rest of the day. You know? Oh, I don't think it's that long of a show, right? Yeah, four and a half hours. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think? Well, come on, we're just I killing was, time I having know, you was, in here. I was, trying to, <laughs> I was trying to. Uh, I was trying to sort of mislead you guys to think that I was going to say I don't think it's that dumb, but I then instead I said I don't think it's that long. <laughs> it's an old comedic joke. It's a device. Um, you know, I don't know how they do it. I mean, I, it's, I guess uh, so, so people ask me something similar too sometimes when they're like, how are you doing stand up as you're sort of promoting a television show and shooting a movie and shooting another movie? And I don't know. It just depends on what drives you. You, know, you really for, enjoy that though. The stand up. I mean, that's something yeah. that's not work to you. That's something that you really enjoy. No, I mean, it's fascinating to me that you can get paid. To do it, you're really paid to travel. That's the really hard part about it. The performing is a pleasure for the most part, especially for someone like me who I improvise a lot of what I do each night. So every night's different. So there's never, it's not, it isn't this grind of like, oh, we're doing a second show tonight. Like they added a second show at 10 p.m. Okay, great. I get to do my same thing over again. That's not it at all. You know, it'll be maybe in the second show, I will do hardly any material at all. Mm -hmm. I'll just talk to the audience or make stuff up or talk about the trip or the day or interview somebody or whatever it is. So it can always be different. So I definitely, I like that, you know. You say that on Transformers 4 that you would get into arguments with Michael Bay. You'd mm -hmm. go at it sometimes. What what was, what were the arguments about? The same arguments I've had with other directors, you know, just where it's like, I don't think that that's the funniest thing. That's you usually, if I'm arguing with the director, that's usually what it's about. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'm not a guy who's going to go, well, I don't understand why my character would walk over there and pick up the water now. <laughs> Just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't do that. If they're like, it, it helps us. If you go over and pick up the water right now, I go, okay, I'm going to go and pick up the water right now. Yeah. But I will sort of come to blows if it's, if I say like, I do not think this is funny or I think this is funny in a way that's going to alienate a big enough portion of the audience that we should look for another joke or I'll say, you know, I just respectfully have to disagree with you. I, um, you know, I, th I think that what I'm, what I'm proposing is the funniest line. It's the funniest thing. That and I Michael Bay would pretty much go, well, go him, screw yourself with him. I'd have to say it like this. I have to respectfully disagree, <laughs> Michael, that you, what you're saying is not the funniest thing, even though you keep yelling at me that it is. <laughs> but then it's so weird. Then other times we would sort of walk over and he'd go, you know, I was thinking last night, like, what's something funny that you could say on the way out of this scene, you know, about surfing? Because I play this stoner landlocked surfer in Texas, right? Let's do it, guys, who drinks a lot and chases ladies. <laughs> do you think it's typecast? Maybe. And then uh you know, I, I would come I would I would come over to him and he'd go, What do you think about like uh, oh now I'll never have enough money for my for my what should be for my surfing safari. You think that's funny? And I'd sort of be like, Yeah, that's really funny. And then he's like, Well what's a funny island that you could say if she goes, Well where are you gonna go? I'm like, I don't know, Kauai? Maybe I pronounced it incorrectly. And he's like, what about Oahu? And I was like, yes, that is the funniest possible <laughs> Hawaiian word that I could say in response to where is your surf and safari going to be. So sometimes he would have the funniest ideas. I mean, more than sometimes, a lot. So it's a weird thing where he is really funny. He knows what he's doing. And I think it's just hard for me as a comedian because I, I do, I have like, produced television and like directed short films and as a stand-up you decide 
everything that you do, and you're in charge of the director, all you, producer, right. all you, all you. And so I, I, it was tough for me, and I finally was able to just a couple of times like relinquish control and just say, TJ, you're in a Michael Bay film, right? This is not your movie. The movie is not about Lucas, the doofus who's running behind Wahlberg. The movie's about robots, and that's what people are there to see. And this is Michael Bay's world, and nobody knows it better than him. When so does it come out, li- Transformers just d- 4? do what he says to do, you know? When does it come out? In June. In June right. 27th, I think. Um, before I let you go, T.J. Miller is here with us. You got into a Twitter it's, war with Dane Cook. It's so funny how thoughtful and what depth you guys have and, like, your demeanors from when... I was list- trying to overhear soul playing scenes yes. and just hear like the intro, intro. it's something like all of your fart partners and all this <laughs> stuff. And then I come in here and you guys are like, now, when you disagree with an individual that you're collaborating with, what would you, uh, and there's like Jim Beam, Devil's Cut 90 in there. I love it in here. You know, it is, uh, it's different than, you've probably been on a million different radio shows. And I'm not yes. like trying to toot my own horn or something or say that I'm great. It's just a different vibe than you get in yeah, I'd say 99% so. of radio shows, yeah. right? They'll come in and they'll go, oh, so tell, you know, basically they want you to just be funny the whole time. Just tell tell us some jokes. Yeah, do, they'll tell you, say, tell you some jokes, do bits, or they'll make fun of you for not being as funny as they thought you were going to be <laughs> then then because they think that makes them They're trying funny. to prove their own funniness. They're kind of like, look yeah. how funny I am because I'm pointing out how you're not funny. I'm like, well, this is the perfect environment to do comedy. It's not competitive and there's no real derogatory judgments being made. Uh, speaking of derogatory judgments, yeah, I went straight at it with Dane Cook online and... Uh, what I'm happened? Gl- you're at, you were at a did. Dane so, Cook show? You we saw the, Dane Cook? We were at the Laugh Factory because we're both factory comedians in Los Angeles. Um, and he's sort of the biggest, that's his domain. You know, he's the king of that castle. And he came in to drop it into a set. And Bobby Lee was there. I don't know if you know him. He's a really funny comedian. He actually, if you want to hear a funny story about Bobby Lee, yeah. he was here. He sat on that very couch and where you're he sitting. he got naked? He got naked. Interesting. How did he, I guess? He he then, but no, the interesting part is that he he got up, he left, and after he got up and left, we noticed there was a skid mark uh, on that white couch. There was literally a skid no mark lie. right Perfect. there, on the, on the, which we then left. Uh, this was probably nine months ago. We then left. It is since we wanted to see how long the skid mark could be preserved on that couch. Right. It's since it, it took what maybe four months. or five months months for it to actually wipe off from people sitting on it. Do you it, but- understand that even when you're talking about leaving a skid mark from a naked guest <laughs> on 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 your white couch, which would be a usual morning show thing, you guys are like, I mean, what do you, what would you say? How long did it take? For it to come off, I'd say seven or eight months. We left it on there, just from other people sitting on it. Finally, it's gone now. You're the final swoop, and we appreciate you cleaning. You could our get couch. some microscopic fecal flakes from Bobby Lee. But I already pants. had. I brought some with me. I bring it in a jar. Some, some of the stuff that I smoke. Um, so Bobby Lee's at well, this he, laugh factory or whatever. So Dane Cook drops in, and he's doing so much time because he does as much time as he wants. That Bobby Lee said, "You know, I'm going to leave." And they said, no, come on, you got to stay. And he said, no, 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 I'm going to go. Just let Dane do as much time as he wants. So then it falls on me to go up after Dane. And um, that's when Dane sort of, he kind of went really long. And he started to kind of, in my opinion, berate the audience and kind of be mean to the audience. And he singled some people out and, you know, and then he did some material that I think people thought was a little misogynistic rather than edgy and kind of like gross and weird. Just, it was mean. Some of it was mean. And he was doing so much time. So I just, you know, I think I was just, you know, drunkenly went off on Twitter and was like, what is this guy's problem? This is why he doesn't have a movie career. Because he doesn't <laughs> understand why you can't alienate people. And he's doing it for himself and really, really laid into him. Um, here, you want to hear what he, uh, <laughs> here's what T.J. Miller tweeted. Effing Dane Cook is eating crap at the Laugh Factory. <laughs> he bumped Bobby Lee and is being just mean. Yep. Uh, he's damaged. He's not a comedian. Watching him try and work through 
his own crap on stage when he is saying, go F a dirty whore, that's the best therapy. You've been doing stand-up for so many years, and you still believe it's okay to bomb and talk about your issues. And then you go on and on and on from there. But. Yeah, it was a pretty heavy thing. And then he sort of, he responded, you know, there's such a level of Dane Cook hate in um, in the United States that I had like... He got too big for... 4,000 for- Twitter followers the next day. They were like, yeah, get him. We hate Dane, but... Since then, it's weird. We we sort of he responded on Joe Rogan's podcast, and then the owner of uh, of the Laugh Factory came and said, "He called me. He said, you and Dane have to make up because it's like a family, and I'm like your father, and I'm telling you brothers fight, but you have to make up." And he was sort of saying like, "If you don't make up, then you can't play the room." Mm. And I don't know who prompted that or if he just did it on his own, whatever. So then I saw Dane at the Laugh Factory months later, and uh, he was in there, and we went around back to talk, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. I'd, I'd never really met him or talked to him. So I didn't know if he was going to lay into me or be upset or if I was going to have to, like, fist fight him or what the deal was. <laughs> you know, I just had no idea. I was like, okay, let's see what this is going to be. And then we, we I went around back, and um, and he started talking, and I immediately found him to be this, like, fairly thoughtful guy who just kind of, it was so clear that this was a pebble that had fallen in a pool where he'd seen boulders, you know, fall into. In in terms of, this was so unaffecting. He kind of just needed to get through this because somebody else was going to say something terrible about him in the next, you know, whatever, and he felt this. I mean, there's a website called I hate Dane Cook dot com. You know, <laughs> TJ Miller started it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good, exactly right. It's my fan site. Um, it's pretty backwards. Um, and uh, he, we kind of made up. And since then, I, I kind of apologized to him. I said, you know what? I shouldn't have gone off on you on Twitter. I just should have come up after the show and just laid into you right there. And he was like, yeah, I wish you would, because then we would have been able to hash it out. And I would have been. And since then, even like I saw him a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, you know, I just got to tell you, like, I, I respect that when I did that, you, you didn't like hold a grudge. You immediately were open to it. And that now I know you in a way where, and he'll even say, he's like, yeah, I'm glad people will still bring it up to me. And he goes, I don't necessarily like what you do on stage and you may not like what I do on stage, but I respect that you're a comedian and you respect that I'm a comedian. And 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 my thing is, I was like, I like that. And now I'm able to say to him, like, are you, you're going to therapy? How's that going? And he's like, good. And it just, you know, it helped me realize that, A, it's a little childish to go off online. And then, like, I'll turn around and make fun of YouTube commenters and be like, <laughs> what are, who are these 15-year-old kids? They're like, man, I don't like this thing. Um, but it's also, uh, it helped me to realize, like, I don't have to be so dogmatic in what a comedian should be. You know, I don't get to decide that a, that a comedian should only be about the audience and making the audience happy and laugh, because they're doing a it's, they're they're in public servitude for their audience. It can also be a guy who's like, I'm hilarious and people like watching me, and this is what I feel like talking about, and this is all about me, and and whether or not you like the jokes. He said you broke the comic code. Uh, yeah, that's whatever that stupid. is. I mean, that is, is there some unwritten no, rule that this, comics have that I don't know about? No, he tried. You know, he tried to say there's this. There's a problem when you get into these fights, because when I say I don't like what he's saying, people go, "Well, he can say what he wants. It's free speech," and I'm like, "Well, then I can say what I want because it's free speech." And they're like, "Yeah, but you can't tell somebody what they can and can't say." <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm not saying that. I'm saying what I do and don't like." Well, you believe saying. then, yeah. And they go, "Yeah, but that you what are you the comedy police? You get to decide what's good and bad." And I'm like, "No. Nobody gets to decide what's good and bad. Everybody hates stuff and loves stuff. I hated this set that he did, and I don't, you know, I don't I don't love his comedy and where it is right now, and I that's okay for me to say, and somehow that got turned into and people love to take sides. So there was Joe Rogan's whole crew was sending me like death threats and Oh my god. All that kind of stuff and then my audience which is like 
Joe Rogan has a pretty rough uh, crew, it seems like. He's yeah. always fighting with someone, punching yeah. someone. I mean, it's... Well, he's, Joe Rogan's like the mafia of comedy, He's I the guess. UFC of comedy. Yeah, right. Yeah, he really is. <laughs> Stay out of his way. I, I mean, know. And all of his fans are like these kind of lughead, meathead guys <laughs> that are really after it. And then all my fans are like weird, bookwormish nerds that are like... Pot yeah, smokers. Right. Yeah, man, Dan's terrible. I'd, I'd send death threats to Rogan, but... Wait, who is he again? <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> what were we just talking about? So Dane Dane Cook uh, is now in therapy. You said, yeah, he's going to therapy now, and he's kind of. His, What's he in therapy for? That I think that he. I mean, ima- ima- I guess just imagine for a second if you worked your whole life, you didn't stand up for fifteen years, and you never quite broken over. You knew pe- you, people loved you, and then suddenly using Napster, you became this famous comedian. And then you slowly ascended to becoming the most famous comedian and the biggest touring comedian, bigger than Steve Martin was. And then imagine if you were on the, you know, time top 50 most powerful people, even if you're in the 50th spot. And then imagine deciding to become a movie star and being in a string of movies, one of which, Good Luck Chuck, is like 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> And imagine in your mind being like, I'm going to be a movie star just like my heroes. And then suddenly America, which I think they rightfully did, is like, you know what? Nope. Never mind. Yeah. We're not going to support this. You you got too big for your britches or you're not funny enough. Or, And I think it was the movie thing. I think he sort of said, well, if I'm this hugely famous stand-up comedian and I'm so good at stand-up comedy... And that should immediately translate to acting. I don't have to do any of the work to become an actor. And that's not how it works. You also can't just go and star in a movie. You have to be in a lot of movies. so that Because you're asking America. America decides who the movie stars are, not Hollywood and certainly not Dane Cook. So that was what happened, I think, is that... You have and to that could get be a America big blow to, to someone's and, ego, basically. Well, I think it would yeah. just... Imagine you became the most famous, successful comedian... And then suddenly you were like not only the laughing stock of Hollywood and the United States, but also like had people saying like I hate Dane Cook. So like, in other words, what you're telling me is Dane Cook is to comedy what Vanilla Ice was to rap. I think so, and I bet Vanilla Ice went to some therapy. Too. Yeah, I mean because he was huge when I was a kid. I right. mean it was massive, and then literally overnight there was an article that came out in a newspaper that that, that researched his history because for six months he was huge, and he would go around saying his. You know, he grew up in a poor neighborhood with gangs and stuff. And they, uh, the newspaper in Dallas uh, did an investigation on it. They go, no, actually, none of that's true. He lived in a pretty uh, uh, upscale neighborhood, and he was called a fraud. And from that point forward, everyone made fun of Vanilla Ice. He was a joke. And the movie thing, too. Cool as ice or cold yeah, as it. ice or whatever the hell it's doing. he was in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, too, I think. <laughs> Two. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Say, wow. The parallels, uncanny. Wow. <laughs> Michael Bay is producing the new uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, wow. Also. Well, uh, you, never a new idea with Michael Bay, apparently. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're all, out of good ideas for movies, I, I guess. We're well, just going to remake stuff and reboot stuff. That's That'll right. That'll be the deal. Yeah, I mean, tomorrow so I you'll actually hear us do damaging. A, we'll do a new interview with TJ Miller. We're going to reboot this interview, and he's going to come <laughs> back tomorrow. We'll start all over, pretend like this one never even happened. It's uh, just some <laughs> other, like, just like Jason Siegel comes in <laughs> to play me. <laughs> uh, TJ Miller is going to be at the Funny Stop Comedy Club tonight at 8 o'clock, but that's sold that's out. That's sold already. out, so we have a 10 o'clock show, and if you can't for some reason make it tonight, but you should, come 10 o'clock next Funny Stop in Cuyahoga Falls. If you can't, come tomorrow to the Woodlands Tavern in Columbus, Ohio where I'm doing another show there for the good people of Columbus. We have a lot of people listening in Columbus, so Woodlands Tavern. Woodlands Tavern, yeah. Uh, TJ, and his his uh, website is tjmillerdoesnotheaveawebsite.com. Yep, tjmiller.com was taken, and the guy wanted two grand for it, so now we're here. <laughs> uh, for tickets for tonight's show, 330-923-4700. That's 330-923-4700. Uh, TJ, good luck with, uh, I'm sure you don't need good luck in Transformers 4 when that comes out. Uh, yeah, there's no luck to it. It'll yeah, just no. make a billion dollars worldwide. Right. But go see Search Party, because that's the first movie... 
that I'm starring in, and I don't want to Dane Cook it. So what is speak. that about? You know, what's it about? Um, it's two guys, me and me and sort of the this you know the straight man go to Mexico to rescue our friend who was carjacked and left for dead naked in Mexico. I think I just read about this in Entertainment Weekly, a yeah. little thing about so this. So it's going to be really funny. It's when really do, funny. When does that it. come out? Probably in September. Oh, wow. So you've already seen August it. It's weird to have to now wait for something to come out, It isn't is it? really weird. Especially, I, and I haven't seen, it's not totally done, but yeah, it's weird. I, I did this movie, She's Out of My League, and we had to wait two years after it was completed for it to come out. I had seen it, I'd watched it test, I knew people liked it, and they just waited on it. They just waited and waited. So... It can be really weird, yeah. Well, uh, good luck with that then, TJ. And uh, see him at the Funny Stop tonight. 10 o'clock is the only show that they have available. I have to take a quick break. I'm running way behind. Uh, we'll wrap everything up right after this on Rover's Morning Glory. Thanks for having me, You're guys. welcome. Thank you, TJ. We'll be right back. We're a bunch Hang of on. thoughtful fart partners. <laughs> Thank you. Rover's Morning Glory.